It's so good. Uh, you look up at that uh, artwork there in our study in 1 Corinthians and are reminded love never fails. Well, that's what you were just singing about, his love for you and our love in return in Christ, in Christ alone, which goes to our, um, our Acts 1A conference is only two weeks away. Are you ready to go or what? Now you normally would see all kinds of things hanging on the walls, but eh, after the $2 trillion we put in here, I didn't think we would <laughs> want to mess with the walls. They look too nice, but uh, uh, we're two weeks away from getting together for our Acts 1A conference, our championship season as we talk about. We've been serving and ministering and being part of so many things over these many months, and then you hit the ninth month and the tenth month, and before you know it, uh, it's everything is gone. And you're going, oh my goodness, Thanksgiving. No, let's not say that too early. It's the Acts 1A conference. Go to Colossians chapter number 3 real quick before we go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter number 6 there, but the theme verses of our conference are found in Colossians. And... Uh, of course, Colossians is a fave book. Um, we studied through this 10 years ago as a church. Uh, and last time we did that, we also did a Bible study on a Wednesday night on it. So, yeah, there, uh, there's 66 of them. And sometimes you uh, repeat a couple of them because they're really, really good. And right now we have our uh, Acts 1 Bible Institute. And in there we have uh, Minor Prophets starting next Sunday. We started up the five T's this past Wednesday, and we'll start up apologetics tomorrow night. Um, has everybody figured out that five T's? You know, you guys got that okay now? Okay, I'm hoping it's not in theology and you know those are the T's. It's First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Timothy and and Titus. You go, oh, you're studying those? Yeah, yeah. You can be a late sign up if you want, but we just got into First Thessalonians and course what a great book that is as well first and second thessalonians and studying through them a model church in the word of god kind of like diametrically opposed to the church at corinth in a lot of ways even though they had their weaknesses and their faults they had truly a solid church there but here in colossians chapter number three we find some favorite verses and verse number one through four let me just simply read them in christ alone if ye then be risen with christ ye seek those things which are above which Christ sitteth on the right hand, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. This is speaking to the believers. It's speaking to the person that knows Jesus as Savior, and you understand something in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall also, so then, so, stop. Don't do it again. There's no so in there. I have to talk to myself sometimes. Do you ever talk to yourself? Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Great verses, great text. And that's the text that uh, we're going to be starting and launching off of. And George Grace will be our guest speaker. I've mentioned it at different times over the last few weeks uh, he was able to uh, block away some time. I talked to him quite a while ago and asked him, and he'll also be out here in the first part of November for a Bible uh, conference, I believe. It'll be a Bible conference in uh, Joe Hendricksman sending church out in Lee Summit. Joe Hendricksman will be here uh, with Amy around that time frame as well, but George will be back out. So he'll be out two times in the space of a few weeks, but we're looking forward to having him. He is a friend of our church. For many, many, many years, he's a tremendous Bible preacher and teacher. He is the director of the Bible Institute in Rochester, New York, North Star Bible Institute. He was the pastor there for 30-plus years and, and uh, now being on, not really on staff, he's doing it really as uh, his retirement project, and, and that has been six years now. George is uh, 75, 76 years young, and he's still going hard. There's a couple of other people that will be visiting with us, and uh, 
the Vances will be here. Sean Vance will be preaching on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. in the fellowship hall. The, the doors will be open. The, the partition will not be up. So all the groups that meet at 9 a.m. from the investor, investors to, uh, disca- uh, excuse me, to discipleship hour and, of course, young families, everybody is invited. And all of you are invited to go to hear Sean preach. Of course, that morning he'll be preaching from the Word of God, but we'll also have him speaking again during the week at 1030 Mario will be here. Mario is the missionary church plant from Mexico City that our team, the mission team that went to Mexico City just a few weeks ago, uh, he'll be here, Del Valle. Uh, Mario is from Vida Nueva and part of the mission work of that work in, that you heard a lot from uh, Steve Kern last year. And we support seven of their works, uh, including, of course, El Salvador and Steve. So you as a church support these men. They will be in. And also, too, uh, just to be reminded that George will be preaching in here at 9 a.m. and 10.30 on Sunday morning. There will be no Sunday evening service. You'll have your little handout uh, bulletin brochure next Sunday, so you'll have it for you. But I wanted to get this out in front of you. Um, so then we also have our coffee house get-togethers, which will be at 6 o'clock on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And uh, Sean will be speaking on Monday evening in there. What we did last year worked out really good. We've had at different times either coffee and dessert out there, drinks and dessert out there, or we've had a meal in the fellowship hall. We're going to stick with this. It was very effective last year. Loved having uh, the missionaries speak each night that we're here. So Monday is Sean be in the coffee house. So come in here anywhere between 6 and 6.15ish, 6.30. Just come in whenever you're ready to come on in and grab a glass of lemonade or a coffee and uh, a few chocolates and, and sit down and enjoy the teaching uh, of missions and the testimony of missions that will come each and every night because uh, Tuesday night, is my clicker not working or is that just, uh, you helping me out, B? Thank you. Help, help out the old guy. I can always use your help, always. But we'll have on Tuesday evening, evening Mario, he will be doing the same thing. A little bit different than Sunday morning. It won't be just a preaching message. You'll be teaching a little bit about missions, how the mission work is going, giving uh, testimony. Then, of course, also, too, uh, taking questions. They will do that. And then there's a couple of guys that you know pretty well, uh, Bobby Bonner and Brian Calloway. They're both in Africa right now. And uh, um, Marty showed me a video of of Bobby getting there at the mission yesterday. And... uh, It was really, uh, you know, they loved that man so very much. And they had a procession. I don't know if if it's on, I don't know, the intranet or whatever they call it. Do they have an intranet thing or something like that? But uh, they had a procession of all the men there at the Kafula Futa Mission and the Bible Institute and showing how they were all greeting him and they were greeting him and and, uh, it's just a beautiful thing. The people of Zambia, of course, especially the believers tied together to that work at GCMS where Brian was for all those years. Brian and Tammy, of course, understand that and Titus. They're so honorable and they honored him and and so Brian and Bobby are over there for one extra special reason other than the things that they're doing on the, on the ground and, and accomplishing some different tasks is very important, both of them for different reasons. But uh, we're going to have them speak on that Wednesday night, and I, I hope that you do not miss it. They're going to talk about international African missions, not as we speak of it from the pulpit. We support, we support Alex and Crystal Chippy, but there's going to be some important news that they will bring back from Africa as they are both there. A great investment in time and talent and treasure to go over there at the same time it was a coordinated effort to meet with some of the uh, leaders there uh, over the ministry things that are going on and what international African missions I am will have to do with the future and what our church will be part of in the future in another way in a fresh way in a fresh vision from God over Zambia Africa and not just Zambia, but Sub-Sahara Africa, as Bobby has had that vision from God for many, many, many years. There's more to come, and uh, to me, it's, it'll be great for you to hear about that. So, looking forward to 
our Acts 1-8 conference week. I wanted to make sure that you grabbed at least a quick preview. Of course, it's on uh, YouTube. It'll be up on our YouTube channel, of course, and the recording. It's on Facebook now, of course. So everybody can go back and say, oh, okay, I heard that a little bit. Uh, just like you do sometimes when you miss some of those emails, and you go back and say, oh, the pastor sent out an email on Friday saying that we had a bed build today at noon. So that's what's going on. There's a bed build at noon as well, of course, as other things going on. Let me just, conti- just uh, keep, have, help something, uh, keep it back in front of you. I mentioned the mission trips. This Wednesday, September 21, uh, we have a um, Oaxaca mission trip team is going to be in here. We're going to have a testimony night. And uh, I will make sure that you get another reminder uh, through our texting platform. Make sure that you know that on Wednesday, we'll be right in here at 6.30, and we'll be celebrating and having testimony night of Oaxaca mission trip and and looking forward to that. Of course, the following Wednesday, I mentioned Mario a little bit ago. He's coming in intentionally on that Wednesday, the 28th, and we are going to have, of course, a testimony night in here for the Mexico City mission trip team. So make sure that you take the time to set aside. We don't do Wednesdays all the time, but these Wednesdays are set aside. We have, of course, our conference on the 5th of October is a Wednesday, we'll be here. So three Wednesdays in a row. If you make one out of three and you hit 333, you can go into the Hall of Fame as a baseball player. So just a thought, you know. But if you can make three out of three, ha, huh, you're hitting a thousand. So praise the Lord, I know you'll be blessed. First Corinthians chapter number six. We've made it through in Christ alone. Through the end of chapter number three, we've done chapter number four, chapter number five last week, and now here we are in chapter number six. Half of it we are going to cover today, the next, the second half of it uh, next Sunday, and then we get into the Acts 1A conference and take a little bit of a break on that Sunday. Then come back to, of course, chapter number seven. As the different uh, seasons and different times go during the course of the year or where God is leading me, In preaching and teaching, sometimes it's an expository study. We'll go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, line upon line, as I mention often. And sometimes there's a topical study. Sometimes we'll get into uh, a topic that God would have us to go through. Even using the scripture when we did Sermon on the Mount a couple years back, there's different times where there'll be a topical study. We did Be Better out of Hebrews a few months back, and that was, again, a topical study. This study in 1 Corinthians is very valuable to each one of us. We are the church. We are God's church. And we can learn from each one of these letters that has been written by the men of God. And, of course, God truly inspired them. And as the Bible says, prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Paul is writing this letter for a particular purpose, and we're beginning to find out more and more of it. But the title of this series has more to do not just with the purpose, but the heart behind it. That Paul really loves this church. That Paul loves all the church plants, and he loves them so much that he wants to love them back through great conviction, great preaching through his writing, and great reproof and correction like the Word of God does, that, hey, there's some things that are just out of whack here. We would say, uh, carefully, maybe just easily, that the church at Corinth would be our worst example. Maybe the vilest church of the early times, of course, in the scriptures is the one we have. We say, wow, they had a tough time. They were a defiled church. They had defrauded the Lord. They had fractions and factions, and they had lots of false doctrine going on there. So... Being in the study, God's led us to it with the idea that truly love never fails and love from God in each one of us through the Lord Jesus Christ can get us to a place where we can resolve some things, build the church up stronger, each one of us personally get stronger in the Lord, and we can say, hey, out there, the testimony in the community is true. We do love the Lord Jesus Christ. We testify of him. We love the word of God. We love one another. And this is 
One of those things where, of course, Jesus laid out a commandment, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You have a love one for another. I repeat that and reiterate that, reiterate that constantly because Jesus is wanting us to live that way as he told the apostles in the church. So our responsibility and our testimony of Jesus amongst the community as the church on the hill on ADP on Adams Dairy Parkway remains vitally important from last week's text and this week's text and continues on, we now know even more so, and it may be just because of a sign of the times, that light shines brighter than ever because the darkness of sin in the world, in our community, and in our country, just our country, the rest of the world, I would say so as well. The things that are going on that are pushing people down, they are rotten. It is mean. The human element of us, the, the human nature of man can only take so much in terms of the physical, the mental. But in Jesus Christ, we can shine the light of the gospel. We can shine in our testimony. We can say, hey, we take the responsibility of being a church in the New Testament in 2022 very seriously. We see that by the Sleep in Heavenly Peace bed build. Why in the world are you doing that? Well, we had a charity golf tournament. We didn't raise money for ourselves. We raised it for a lot of different organizations over the years. We raised money this year. Nearly, by the way, almost $11,000. Praise the Lord for that. We're going to be able to build 40 beds. And all of you are welcome to be out there. There's free pizza also, too. Well, actually, you paid for it with your offerings. But... But really, truly, it's a big piece of what we are doing. People can drive by. Why is your parking lot full? Well, then there's co-ed softball a little bit later. Why is your parking lot full? What are you guys doing up there? It ought to be a testimony that at the centerpiece of it all is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his church. This is his word. We believe in it as believers that we're going to live it out by faith. And we're going to say, God, use us. God, have us be right on the front lines. We're going to take some punches. We're going to take some bumps and bruises. We're going to go through some tough times. But in Christ alone, we remind, we're reminded that our presence here remains vitally important. God's people are involved in the work of the mission. You are involved, and I thank you for that. And we need to be more deeply grounded in his word so that we don't get in a place where we go, oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Oh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Oh, you're teaching things that aren't there, and you're not teaching the things that are there. Well, pastor, then teach what is there. Let's look at it, learn what it says, and then move with it. This is our responsibility and our testimony. I hate to have the church hear from Paul the Apostle. Of course, we couldn't. We hear from God the things that he said to them. Now, on the one side, it wasn't so bad. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, Paul had some rebuke. He said, hey, I'm not to shame you. I'm not shaming you, but I'm warning you. So he said, hey, I'm not saying this to shame you. It's in verse number 14 up on the screen. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. I mentioned that verse last week. He said, hey, I'm not trying to tear you down to shame you. I just want to tell you these things to warn you that when you're in, this, in the middle of this stuff, it could get you in a lot worse shape. I mean, when you, again, when you look at that verse up on the screen, you're going, wow, look at that. He didn't say it to shame he didn't put it, there you go. I shame you, but I love you. You're my beloved sons, and I'm warning you. I like that rebuke. That's kind of good. But as a church that may be in a place of having to learn some things, we might get some rebuke in another form. Because it would be better to get that than, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, I speak to your shame. I speak to your shame. I say, hey, you know what? I would rather hear that other one than the rebuke says, hey, I'm speaking to your shame. What do you mean? Chapter number six, verse number five, I speak to your shame. It's up on the screen. It, is it so that there is not a wise man among you? We'll get into this deeper in a moment. No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brother. Gosh, that gets a little bit rougher. Before, he says, in chapter number 4, 
in the context of the instructors and you don't have a father, I don't speak this to your shame because I feel bad that you have exalted the instructors, exalted the instructor, uh, the, uh, the knowledge that you've gotten, but you really don't have that father figure that I am in your life. I speak this to your shame, not to your shame, but I warn you. But now here we are in chapter 6, and he's saying, you guys are not handling matters properly. There's controversy. There are uh, difficulties between people, and you're not handling it properly. I speak this to your shame. When it comes right back to it, this founding church, excuse me, the founding of this church came, of course, in the early 50 A.D.s. And we realize that Paul did this and came after this in his missionary journeys, Acts chapter number 16, 17, 18. We see again where in 17 it's when this church is birthed. And we see again where he did it out of love for the Lord first and for the people of Corinth. But he then hears something not so good, in fact really bad, and the church, when he's over at the church at Ephesus, and he, he has been there for three years, he hears, whoa, there's not unity in the body. They don't really get after servanthood. They're going after the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of themselves and not God's wisdom. I need to preach a message to them through a letter about their morality, about their liberty and how to handle it. I have to deal with the sexual sin That's what Paul is compelled to do. But he's doing it out of love. He's even sending the rebuke out of love. So in his stead, in God's stead, I come to you as the pastor and say, we need to look at these passages of Scripture and say, God, what do you want from us? How do you want us to handle these things? What is it that you're teaching us? So how should we? God's saints in the body of Christ, how should we settle disputes between one another? How should we do it? We should do it with faith and live it out daily. We should have faith in the Father in heaven. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We need to live above the noise and make sure that, hey, as God's saints in the body of Christ, we settle disputes between each other properly because that's what this text is today. How do we settle them? How don't we settle them? We live faith. If you look at chapter number one of this book, it says in verse number nine, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is even speaking of faith. He's speaking of this love he has for them before he gets into the contentions that are among them because one's of Paul and one's of Cephas, and there's difficulties that he immediately gets dealing with, but he's saying, hey, God's been faithful to you. You ought to live it out by faith. This is where we need to be. Consider what Paul was saying here. He is telling them, hey, it's got to be done by faith. Also, too, on the other side of it, what about the community? What should the community at large learn of how we, as the church, handle controversy? So the community hears about something that happens, and there's a controversy, whatever it may be. And it comes to light in some way, and the community says, why are you doing it that way, or whatever it may be? We should then clearly say, hey, when the community hears things, and how we did or didn't handle it properly, we should say, With love that never fails is how we've handled it. And we hope that that will be the testimony in this community. The community of Corinth had a testimony about the church there that they did not handle their matters well. They did not see that the church, God's church, is a place of grace They did not see that it is a place of justness and righteousness and to do things right. 
Paul said in verse number 4 at the beginning of chapter number 1, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and all utterance and in knowledge. Hey, very simply, with love that never fails is how the community should hear that we handled controversy. With love, with faith, with grace. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 ends with a very strong reference to our duty as Christians to judge matters within our family. Again, each chapter, each section of Scripture, each package has a text, a context. It's giving us teaching. And at the end of chapter number 5, you see verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? What, you, you, you know about the lost world. You know about your community that you want to reach with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about taking care of things within your community, in the church, within your congregation? Verse 13, but them that are, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Very simply, you have the scripture. You have the way of doing it. You have the model of Jesus Christ. You have the model of me bringing the word. I was there for 18 months. We got the church started. I left some good instructors there. And yet, you were more concerned with the knowledge you could gain from one particular instructor than the incredible father-son relationship that you can have and how you cannot lift yourself up with all the great stuff you know, but rather by how you handle matters in the church. Very simply then, that leads to the title of our message today, Contain the Controversy. How do we handle controversy? How do we have things that come up and they're basically civil matters and how do we solve them? Do we go to the world and ask them to solve them for us? That's the text today. That's, oh, well, you're going to go to court and bring a civil matter to someone. Now, I'm not talking about a legality matter where it, inv it, it involves something that someone's broken a law. But we're talking about God's word teaching us how to handle civil matters. The truth of the matter is, and you know this, there's a lot of lawyers and if you're a lawyer today, hallelujah for you. You must be an amazing person to handle all the stuff that you handle. But here you have a time. Here's an article from May 24th that talks about Christians suing each other. May 24th, 2022. These type of cases that are, this is a, a website called Ministry Watch. They include defamation, discrimination, divorce. Some cases also involve allegations of sexual abuse. So some of them are things that really need to be dealt with. But others are cases, this like 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, where you say, why couldn't they handle that? The bottom line is, maybe we just close the Bible and don't use it. Oftentimes we have someone who's offended and they can't work the issue out. And when it comes to articles like this, I wonder if they're happy to write them. I don't know that, but I wonder because, again, it makes God look bad. We don't want the Lord to look bad. Here's an article a number of years back. It says, Scripture makes it pretty clear that brothers and sisters in Christ should not be suing one another. There are better ways to handle disputes among believers, referencing 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verses 1 through 11. Mediation or arbitration through the church or a professional arbitrator, arbiter offer pathways to reconciliation in view of, quoting Matthew chapter number 18. The bottom line in this today with how we're looking at the scripture is that this matter came up. It came up in 56, 57, 58 AD, and it's come up many, many centuries later, and it's come up all along the way. And when you look at lawsuit statistics and, and things like that, it, it overwhelms you. Maybe some of you are in the midst of those type of things. But when it comes to the church, it ought not to be so until it really has to be so. But it ought not to be so. 
because we can contain the controversy if we follow the Scripture. And we're going to see that Paul, again, by the Spirit of God, God's Word tells us how we, as a church, learn, once again, in a very important matter, how to deal with civil issues. Well, we're just going to quote the Bible and tell them, and if they don't like it, too bad. Oh, no. It's a little more than that. It's you and I saying, okay, let's do the hard things and do them well and not be in a place where the church at Corinth was. Follow along with me, verse number one, chapter number six. Let me read it. I'm going to go down 11 verses, and then we'll make some lesson points off of these 11 verses. Right off the bat, dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? I was actually just going to call the title of the message, How Dare You? That would have been a good title, what do you think? But the context of our message really lends itself to how do we contain the controversy? How dare you? Well, dare any of you, Paul says, verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. That's your position in the Lord Jesus Christ, church, believers. Verse 4. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. That's the key verse, the key part of the verse, in the church. The least esteemed in the church should be able to have a, handle a matter in the church and not have to go outside the church to the legal court system. That's what Paul's saying. Because verse number 5 brings a little sarcasm from Paul. I know some of you that are from New England, like me, love sarcasm. Some of you who are not from New England love sarcasm. He says in verse number 5, a verse that I just used earlier, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Is there not someone who even is the lowest esteemed person in the Scripture, in the Word of God, in your church that cannot handle this matter? You'd rather go outside the church and do it? Verse 6, here we go. But brother goeth to war, excuse me, brother, go, I don't know, that was a slip, but it came out pretty good. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that's your brother. Verse 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now look at this list. You say, oh, this wicked, awful sin. Well, verse number 11 gives you a perspective on why he's bringing it to bear here in the context of this matter. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves and mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Here it is, verse 11. Those are the lost people in that place in this context saying, whoa, verse number 11, and such were some of you, were some of you. Yeah. Some of us that got saved at a later age understand that stuff. What a list. It says there in verse number 11, powerful doctrine. You're washed and you're sanctified and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When you get saved, when you got saved, you are washed, justified, and sanctified. Woo! But don't forget, not all of you, 
But such were some of you at one time. All of us were lost at one time. At eight years old, you didn't do any of that stuff. But just think, when you came to Jesus Christ, you are the part of such. Some of you. Now let me pray for a minute, and then we'll make some real quick lesson points and be done. Now our Father in heaven, we've had a sweet time already in Jesus alone, in Christ alone. We previewed the Acts 1-8 conference. We had some beautiful songs that we sung, hymn songs, spiritual songs, beautiful stuff. We have prayed a little bit. And we're praying some more right now. We've read the word. We've had a little bit of an introduction. So, Father, right now, for the next few minutes, pull this all together. Bring it to bear in exactly the way that the Holy Ghost would teach us. Please teach us everything you want us to grab, each one of us individually, everyone here, the dozens and dozens of people. You can do that work, and I ask you again, as I've already prayed, and pray again that you will do that in this moment, in this next few minutes. We love your word. We love you because you first loved us. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Contain the controversy. When you think again about just putting that down, we're reminded of what controversy is. It's a disputation. It's a quarrel. It's strife. How do you contain a controversy? Well, a controversy usually begins with some type of disagreement or discussion. And then there's these opposing sides. I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. I'm right. You're wrong. Well, that's usually the case. Usually I'm right. And you're wrong. And then it gets really crazy. Then there's a controversy that Somehow we get at an impasse. Now I want to bring a civil lawsuit. Latest numbers, it's almost 25,000 civil suits are brought to bear every month in the United States of America. That's in some of the recent statistics that I could find searching it out. Wow. There's a lot of civil lawsuits going on from the believers, from the church. Can we not get to that point? Can we find in the scriptures how to handle things? We can. It's whether we will choose to do so or not. You say, well, gosh, I can't. unless I get a judge that's going to bring a ruling down, you submit yourself to the world system of law instead of God's word and God's law, you are now stepping out of the boundaries of the church and you as a believer when it comes to these civil matters. That's what Paul is telling us. That's what the Holy Spirit is teaching us. So here's our first lesson point. I'm going to make a statement and then support it with a little bit of a tie scripturally. Here we go. The church has a great destiny, future, and responsibility in the reign of Christ. Agreed? Yes. If that is our destiny, then we ought to learn to settle our differences and difficulties now. Now Corinth's a messy church. We're not messy like that church, but we have our stuff, of course, because our stuff is filled with the stuffed animals that we are. I'm just kidding. But they had a lot of disorder. Again, I said it earlier. They had factions abounding, mostly because of human pride and spiritual ignorance. They didn't know. They they stopped knowing, or they decided to use the world's wisdom to handle matters instead of God's wisdom. Human pride, I'm right, you're wrong constantly. And here it is. You and I, when we said, I'll call in the name of the Lord to save me, forgive me of my sin, give me whatever, God, give me eternal life now, whatever life you give me, praise the Lord from this moment on, whatever it is. But I did decide when I said, call on the name of the Lord to save me, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall save me, I will be saved. The Bible then teaches me, hey, I mentioned this last week. <laughs> we jumped in on this high standard called Jesus. Well, I can't be perfect. I can't be opposite of sin. I can't. You can be all that God would have you to be to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what the Bible says. 
By his word, by his spirit, he will make you and he will make this church that way. That's the, the, the conflict as a pastor. The conflict is some of you are more mature saying, boy, I wish we could just do more and do more and do more and grow. Well, how about if we just become more like Jesus Christ? That would be good. So that we're not complacent and we're not insensitive to the matters of those that are around us. Let us not negate our position and power in the gospel. We have a position in the gospel. We have a a power in the gospel. And he's telling us in verse number two, hey, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do you not know the position that you have as a believer in Christ? What is the doctrine and all that? Call the office this week and ask somebody to teach you the Bible. You call and ask, say, I don't know much about all of this. You're mentioning stuff that I don't know anything about. We have people that will teach you the Bible. We have pe- I tell you this every few weeks. You want, I want to learn more. I want to have these answers. What is the position and power we have in the gospel? It says that if the world shall be judged by you, verse 2, ye, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Why would you go to a civil courtroom and expose yourself to their way of doing things. That judge does not care about you like God cares about you. I do not care if they're born again. They have to go by the law that's written in this land, and this law that's written in this land doesn't always exalt the name of Jesus Christ. So why would I go to that? Well, because I've had an awful time with my brother. Stay with it. I can't resolve this with my sister. Stay with it. Ask for someone to teach you and show you. Ask someone to be an arbitrator, spiritually speaking. Will they stop talking to me? Pray for them. Care for them. Send them a card. Do all that you can, but do not negate your position and power in the gospel and go to someone else to judge the matter. You go to someone else to judge that matter that's not born again, or someone who goes to take a lawsuit, you've, set, you've just said, God, I'm the church, part of the church, I'm a believer, I'm going to be judging angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. That's a deep doctrinal truth here about which you would have to learn. But keep in mind this. We have a special spot in God's heart as the church. Jesus Christ, he is our groom. And we are his bride. And that means that for every one of us, we need to go after that power and that position in the gospel, not to jut our chests out, to be humbled and say, I can't negate what you've given me in the gospel and the word of God and his power. The second thing, here's a statement. The church often presents lofty truths or doctrines, but they don't have the grace to get along or get their oversight together. I wouldn't say that's our church. I I love how we get along really well. Do we have some hiccups and some brokenness in some areas? Sure. But often churches just present their, we have this way of doing things, we have our lofty doctrines and truths, and that's what we are. And we can't get, can't get it along by grace, and we, we don't have the oversight that's biblical? People, you have some amazing men that lead you spiritually in this church. You have some amazing couples that teach and mentor and disciple and do all that they can. This is the point. They center up on the Word of God just like we are and say, this is what we're supposed to do. The scriptures both teach the principles of personal interaction and how to lay hold of grace to forbear one another. It's in the scriptures. Seeking legal help outside of the church. What do you think the church judge or those people or those civil lawsuits, those lawyers are going to tell you? Well, you just need to be more loving and kind and be forgiving. (laughs) They're going to tell you to go after that person to win your lawsuit. The church often presents lofty truths and doctrines, but they don't have the grace to get along their oversight. Let us not demean the efficacy and the legitimacy of the Scripture. Verse number four, five, and six. 
If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Hey, even you as a church member who's a young believer has more together in what the scriptures say. All I know is that Jesus saved me and he forgives and he loves me unconditionally. That's a good way to start for how you could mend a controversy. I'm a young believer. All I have is my testimony. How about saying I remember that when God forgave me, he gave me a different spirit. I now am able to look at my people in my family that didn't like me and I didn't like them and I have a heart for them now. All you, all you need to do is realize what you are transformed in Jesus Christ. You have a new spirit. You're brand new. You've been quickened. You've been made alive. You've been buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's what happens in a baptism. You are buried in Christ. You've been immersed in Jesus Christ. You are born again, and you have a new life in Christ. And let me just tell you, that's a great starting point. But that can carry you all the way through to fix anything. I have found that to be true. Every time I thought I needed to get more knowledge in a more heady, heady way, and I had to get more lofty doctrines and more truths and be the smartest man in the room, by the way, that don't work at all. Only by pride cometh contention, but with a well advised is wisdom. God has broken me over his knee a thousand times, and he will continue to do it. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. Why would I want to do that? Well, let me go to the judge over there at the court and pay my lawyer $300 a, an hour so that I can contend with my brother. This is foolish. That's what Paul said. He said, hey, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Yes, there is. There's plenty of wise people among us. Let us not demean the efficacy and legitimacy of Scripture. Again, seeking legal help outside of the Scriptures and its principles of how to personally interact and lay hold of grace, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. The Scriptures will teach you how to forbear one another and forgive one another. Put on Jesus. You say, that means that I'm just going to have to swallow a lot. You better believe it. I heard there's one that came before you that swallowed a hollow more than you're ever going to swallow. As he hung on that cross for you and me. Not one bit of arrogance in our Savior. Not one bit of pride. All the power in the universe that was under control. Is that not the definition of meekness? Third thing. The very nature of Christianity is conciliatory. Would you not agree with that? Christ taught peace, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, unity, and love. The very nature of Christ's likeness is conciliatory. When you put RE in front of it, it's just new conciliatory reconciliation. Is the battle, the fight, the contest, and the strife what you live for? It was at one time in my life. God, forgive me. So many times I begged him to forgive me. Just to pick up a mallet to hit somebody because I was smarter and more right. The nature of Christianity is conciliatory. Maybe you've got to go through some lessons of life like I have, like all of us that are a little bit older in Christ have. And after a while you realize pride does come before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And it is so true. Let us not forsake the victory and the example in Jesus Christ. You have victory. And you have an example. And you want to go get a victory in the court of law out there against someone that God loves like you because they're a son of God. What, what is that? What is the matter with us? What is the matter with the church of Corinth? Let's pick on them for a while. We're all drawn to the same place to do that. 
Is it the passages of Scripture that tell us that if we lose ourselves, we gain Christ? When we forsake the victory and example in Jesus Christ, we lose and we lose. Go to Matthew 5 for a moment. Matthew 5. I'll just read it real quick. If you're able to make it there, that's good. I heard there was this passage called the Sermon on the Mount. Just going to read it. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Let it speak to you. And if you want to dispensationalize everything out of the Bible, then okay, fine. But the bottom line is this. This is written because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God is written to you and me. Here we go. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse number 39, chapter number 5 of Matthew. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. These are the things that are missing. The essence of Jesus. Not you knowing more doctrine than somebody else in the room. It's the love of Jesus Christ so pure and so beautiful that it never, ever fails. Never fails. His love never, never fails. Paul started this church. How do you think brokenhearted he was? Well, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what Paul's gone through, and you don't know what Jesus has gone through, and yet you're whining and crying over what you're going through. He was brokenhearted. He started this church, and they are falling apart, and yet he says, I love you. I love you. Put on Jesus before you make a mess out of things so bad that the community won't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. Verse number 41 and 42, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Wow. Oh, I remember that was in the Bible, yeah. Yeah. Jesus was only harsh with pure motive and pure heart without sin to those called the Pharisees. It's the only ones. And he still gave them love. He still gave them love. Last one. Up on the screen. It is contrary to the nature of Christianity to do anything that would injure another. Why would someone intentionally hurt someone else? To demean them and destroy them. It's totally contrary to the nature of Christ to do anything that would injure another or take advantage of another by legal methods. I tell you what, I know the law better than you. I'll fix you. I'll straighten you right out. I know the law, and I'm a lawyer, and I'll tell you what, I'll fix you. Why would someone even do that? Well, <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. After he says there, verse 7, why do you not rather take, why, why don't you just suffer the defrauding? Just go through it, even if you're going to go through it. Because know you not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not care about the lost people, everybody? Do you not care, he's saying, do you not care about the lost souls? Because some of you were, a decei were deceived by your stature. Because there's idolaters and fornicators and adulterers. There's this whole long list. But verse number 11, such were some of you. Have you forgotten that the lost world needs Jesus Christ so that he can be washed like you? Be sanctified like you? And be justified like you? Let us not contradict the beauty and the character of the church. Let us not contradict this beautiful church that God has made for his son Jesus. And Jesus gave his life for it. Let us not contradict the beauty, the character of this church, of his church. Let us prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If I just take care of me, then I can possibly be available to take care of others. 
Simply consider the lost world again around you. Consider that there are fornicators and idolaters and adulterers. They, they, they don't know. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have a love one for another. Greater love hath no man than this, they lay down his life for his friends. I'll never forget the filthiest, vilest man that I thought of was in Rochester, New York, and Mike Metzger and Luis Metzger. I've said it before. All they did was love me and point me to the scriptures. And all God did was love me in the midst of my reprobate mind and the filth of my life. And one day, just one day, I finally got to the end of myself and called out to Jesus to save me. I was one of them. Just like some of you, like the scripture says. Such were some of you. But now we're washed. Oh, we're washed. We're sanctified. We're justified. That's beautiful. Let us not contradict the beauty and character of the church. It is our shame as Christians for airing our personal matters in a secular court of law. It is our shame as Christians to air, for airing our personal matters in a secular court of law. Forget about the lost world anymore. I'm going to submit myself to corrupt people to have them solve a difficulty that maybe one day God could solve for the testimony of Jesus. So I ask, our testimony in our community, are we a plus or a minus in the city of Blue Springs? I think we're a plus. And I say hallelujah for Jesus Christ and for God's people. And we need to stay there. And we need to come to a place where our testimony in the community means so much to us because it's a responsibility to bring the gospel to all those people. Of the 58,000 people in this city, never mind all the other cities around us, what percentage of them do you think is really born again? And how many of those that are not see us as a testimony of Jesus Christ the Lord? Please bow with me for a word of prayer as we come to our time of prayer. As the music plays in the background, let me just ask you again with your heads bowed, and your eyes closed. Are we a plus or a minus? Maybe in this time of invitation, you'd come pray for this church. You'd come pray for your brothers and sisters. Maybe you'd come pray for a matter that's upon your heart that you know needs to be resolved to contain the controversy. Thank you, Father, for your word, for your spirit, for your people that have gathered here today for, again, a beautiful time of worship and giving you glory. Now I ask you, please, I pray, have your way in this time of prayer, in this time of invitation. If there's anyone here that's lost, that is just troubled by thoughts of things that are just from a lost person's life, I pray that even they would come. And maybe even later in the service or afterwards, just come and, I don't know how it will be, but just bring them and draw them. And for your people, the believers in this church, I pray that you would draw on their hearts to deal with whatever God you put on their hearts. In Jesus' name, please stand. Please stand. We won't.